Okay, we are recording. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to announce that today I have a very special guest, none other than Steven Erickson, author of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, the Carcanus Trilogy, the, uh, the new uh, installment in the Witness Trilogy, The God is Not Willing, the Bokalin and Corbel Brooch novellas, and many other books outside of the Malazan world. Thank you so much, Steve, for being here today. Really well, appreciate it. Well, well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's nice to be back. I, awesome. I recognize the background. It's all good. I recognize yep. the blazer. It's, it's good. <laughs> it's familiar, familiar with my mandalas in the background. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I recognize your background too. Uh, well, yes, my yep. cruddy background, yes. I like it. I like it. So, well, actually, we have a, a kind of a special reason uh, for this discussion, which is that I have produced a translation of a poem that you wrote. And this is the prefatory poem to the entire series, The Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is what you, a poem you will find at the very beginning of Gardens of the Moon. Yeah. So, and at my request as well. So I'm so appreciative that you actually rolled up your sleeves and, and you know put on the, the academic gown for this one and uh, the artistic, I guess, as well. Because you know yeah. to translate into, into Old English is pretty serious challenge. It is a challenge. Yeah, it's not something yeah. you normally do. But when your favorite author asks you to do a little thing, and uh, you know, it's also the least I can do, frankly, given how much you've given me in, in these books. Uh, so if, if I can do just a tiny little thing like that, that would be, uh, be uh, uh, you know, that would please you, then I'm just delighted. So uh, very, I get it. it's fun. I'm so looking forward to hearing it spoken for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it's a fun thing for me too. So I actually had a lot of fun while I was doing it as well. So, <laughs> so great. So I, yeah, this is the, the poem and I don't know, it's not titled in Gardens yeah. of the Moon. So I just sort of uh, for a working title called it Book of the Fallen. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll just sort of call it that today but that is not the official title just so people know. I also want to acknowledge somebody that was very, very helpful uh, to me in this endeavor, and that is Dr. Sarah Anderson from Princeton University. I, I, she, so I'm a total stranger to her and out of nowhere emailed her and said, hey, I'm doing this translation for this fantasy author, Steven Erickson. Uh, would you be cool with looking at it for me and, and giving me a cool. little, and she was just so gracious. Uh, and so nice and, and gave me some very helpful tips as well. So I do want That's to really acknowledge cool. her for that. Yeah, she yeah. was just very gracious. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, she actually has taught uh, some fantasy before as well. And right. although she hasn't read your books yet, uh, she had heard of you and had some positive things to say about you. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, uh, let's, let's go ahead and do this. And so the first thing we're going to do, everyone, is I'm going to have Steve read the original poem, which I will put up on the screen. You will see our faces suddenly get small in the corner of the screen, but that's so you can see the original poem and I'll have the translation right under it. And uh, Steve will read the original and then I will read the translation. And then I will explain some of the, um, the choices that I made while doing the translation. And then finally, we're gonna have a spoiler part at the end, this is gonna be a spoiler for the entire series. So if you have not finished the series, you might not wanna hear that final part, but I will give a warning before we get to that part. So that'll be at the end. All right, so let me see if I can figure out the technology mm -hmm. here. I'm gonna share my screen. And you should now see. I can see it. The okay. Original poem. And whenever you're ready, Steve, to read the prefatory poem to the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Okay. Now these ashes have grown cold, we open the old book. These oil-stained pages recount the tales of the fallen, a frayed empire, words without warmth. The hearth has ebbed, its gleam and life sparks about memories against dimming eyes. What cast my mind, what hew my thoughts as I open the Book of the Fallen and breathe deep the scent of history. Listen then to these words carried on that breath. These tales are the tales of us all, again, yet again. We are history relived, and that is all. Without end, that is all. Thank you, yeah, that's, that is lovely. 
That is lovely. And there's something I feel about a lot of your, your poetry, a lot of the epigraphs that I've read, that is very understated. Yeah, and, and even my reading style is understated. So I, I, I yeah. quite, I should have prefaced with that, but um, it is. <laughs> well, I think it's entirely appropriate. And it, even though it is understated, and this, by the way, is, is a common feature of Old English poetry too. So it's kind of fitting in a way with what we're doing. But, really, really, I would have oh, thought, yeah. uh, I mean, I think about the opening to Beowulf, which I've heard in, in, in Old English, and it's, you know, it's declamatory. It's, it's yes. the pounding of the fist on, on the table in, in the Great Hall, you know, it's yeah. so, yeah, that's interesting that, that you would say it, it's understated. Yeah, so you're absolutely correct. It is declamatory. That is, that is a, the perfect word to describe it. But at the same time, there are parts of the po of, mm. of Old English poetry where they do use lightities or understatement a lot. And oh, right. uh, so th not in the same way that your, your, uh, uh, the tone of your poem is understated, but in the sense that uh, if you have uh, a warrior who's just been stabbed with a mortal wound or something like that, and, um, and uh, the, the, the poet might declare something like he would have rather been somewhere else or something like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's so that's sort of, that's what I mean by understatement in Old English poetry. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's a different thing. It's not so much the tone, uh, but yeah. So, so, so but, uh, there's an element of wryness to it then. Absolutely. Commentary. There is an yeah. element of wryness. Oh, I like that. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. And uh, but but even though I would say for me, the way I experience your poetry a lot of the time is that even though it feels on the surface, there's this sort of still peaceful surface, but there is a ton of emotion beneath there. There is a, a lot of uh, uh, pathos beneath that still surface that I mm. that's what I bring to it anyway. And um, I don't know if that's something you intended or not, but I, I feel that a lot yeah. when I'm reading your poems. Um, as best as I can recall, the original draft of Gardens of the Moon as adapted from the screenplay mm -hmm. didn't have any of this. And I huh. think this poem appeared um, probably when I was revising my final, my final draft. Wow. And so if I think about, I would have been sitting in a pub called the the Bush huh. uh, in Dorking, uh, Surrey, in England. Yep. Uh, late at night, um, I was always dragged into the um, the quizzes because uh, I was I was the only North American there, so you know I could answer certain questions that <laughs> others couldn't. So the quiz would have been finished. Uh, I probably would have had a pint or two of Guinness, um, and I would have just finished what I thought would, well, what ended up being this manuscript that, that you see. Huh. Um, and so I was probably tired and I was probably um, worn out slightly um, and in the cups as it were. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking when I was rereading this thing, I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that's kind of, it was kind of a long sigh running through the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why I knew, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but this poem picks up again at the end of the series um, yes. to close the series. Yes. Um, and I think even here, I knew that when I finally got to that second, second section, uh, I was going to be in the similar state. <laughs> you know, I was going to be utterly exhausted for having finished the series. And uh, that sigh had to come through again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it comes through beautifully here. <laughs> and uh, by the way, uh, Guinness is, was also my beverage of choice when in the UK. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and I finally I finally got to have some in Dublin. Um, so the Guinness that doesn't travel, as it were. And yes. that was that was utterly stunning. Yeah. Yeah. I would try. I would like to try that, too, sometime. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So. All right. Well, let's read the Old English version. Uh, my translation. Okay. I'll just let everybody kind of hear it first. And after that, I will explain some of the choices I made as a translator. So let's just go for it here. And it's called, in Old English, uh, Book of the Fallen is Bok Thara Fealindra. Nu zinden das ashen chelda, swawe openia yeldan bok, was leofu elefagum, 
talathara feanra re chath, kin riche werina, word frovro leasa. So her thwanoda, his glitinum, on her sperkan, on yeminda on wuniath, eagam wakiendum behindem. Who fareth min mod, what zindon mino ye hildas, so echo penia, the pok thara fealinra, on ediat on a stench yer daga. What? So edgum fareth thus word, hlosniat eum, thus tala zindon ura, yalra tala, on ert ura tala. The year dagas on os viviat, the year dagas endoleasa. So, yeah, I think you can hear that more declarative. Uh, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I love the huat, which of course reminds me of Beowulf. So, very yep. quickly. That yeah. is deliberate. Yeah, I put yeah. that in there uh, if, deliberately, uh, but also because I thought it fit at that particular oh, yeah. moment. Um, and also because I also have the, the year dagas, which is also reminiscent of Beowulf. So there are a couple of Beowulf nods there at the end for sure. Uh, but let's start at the beginning and I'll explain some of, um, just not everything, but a few of my, my choices here. And I'll just sort of do a literal translation so you mm -hmm. can kind of hear what I've done actually, that might be mm -hmm. helpful. So, new and you'll notice uh, just a few general comments. So Old English poetry, as you know, uh, is um, it is alliterative usually. Mm -hmm and it is stress-based. There mm -hmm. are four stresses in every line and the first three stresses generally alliterate. Yeah. So I did not preserve the alliteration here. I did not make it alliterative. There's a, some alliteration for sure, but I did not go by that, that standard of first three stresses in every line. And yeah, but you, you were definitely consistent in the falling off at the end of, at the, end of the lines, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So well, you, you do have some on enjambment in your original poem, and that would not be a very common thing at all in Old English poetry. It's very oh, right. rare. Yeah, very rare. So you would have in Old English poetry, not that, not that the, uh, well, so the poem, the man, in manuscripts, we don't have any punctuation because these things were written on vellum and they had to mm -hmm. To, which was very expensive. And so they mm -hmm. had to write just across the entire manuscript and then to the next line. So when we produce something like you see here or a real old English poem, uh, it'll be written like this. A lot of conjecture is involved, mm -hmm. particularly if the manuscript is damaged and, and that sort of thing, or there are scribal errors, all kinds of things. So, but generally speaking, they'll finish a thought um, and you won't see a lot of repetition, like in the original poem where you have um, uh, that is all, that is all, the repetition there. That would not be something you'd see very often in Old English poetry. However, you do see apposition all the time. So apposition being like in Beowulf, where you'll have Beowulf introduced and he comes into the scene and, and uh and the, the poet will say something like, Beowulf spoke, the son of Edstheo, the mighty warrior, the prince of, you know, on and on. And there's this, it sort of builds on itself that way. That's called apposition. So it's mm -hmm. not exactly repetition, but you do have that feature. Uh, so I do have, yeah. I do produce yeah. some repetition in the translation you'll see, but. Um, I, I would think a lot of that, you know, when you, when you look at, if you're thinking this is oral tradition, then we are looking at breath, breath length um as yes. being sort of the way the way lines are broken up in terms Precisely. of how something repeated um Precisely. Yeah. but then you got mnemonic devices as well and what you're describing there i think with the beowulf thing is, is similar to in the iliad you know you get yeah you get these these um wine dark sea phrases um oh yeah and and they are i i I mean, they have to be mnemonic devices of, of some form to to recapture the rhythm, to to give pause to the the listener, um, and that familiarity. Uh, yes, it all flows in. Yeah, yeah, that is precisely correct. And I actually my my master's thesis, not my my PhD dissertation, but my master's thesis was about the oral formulaic nature of Old English poetry, focusing on the wanderer, the Old English poetry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So you're absolutely correct about that. And uh, you'll see here that I put caesuras in to show where the pauses are. Yeah. So there'll be two stresses in the first half line and two in the second half line. 
Um, and that's how we usually see Old English poetry produced in, in you know, modern times. Um, so, so yes, absolutely. And um, strong, you know, very stress-based, uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, uh, very declarative. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, and lots of apposition and that sort of thing. So I didn't exactly, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that what, if, if somebody in the 10th century were to hear this poem or uh, recite it, they'd understand it, and they, they it might. I, I've, I, I'd like to think that they would find some of it actually poetic. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, it's it's a tricky business, though, as we said earlier, yeah. uh, because it's a dead language, yeah. and translating at any time from one language to another is a tricky business because of connotations and yeah. being lost, and so many things, so many choices you have to make. Are you going to go with the aesthetics or are you going to go with faithfulness to meaning? And usually when you pull more toward one side, you get away from the other. It's it can be a tricky thing. Um, but, and of course, in the case of old English, it's a dead language. So we have no one to ask, you know, does this actually make sense? You know, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah. So we have here uh, in the first line, Nuzindan thas ashan chelda, which simply means now are. Uh, these ashes cold. So very, pretty, pretty straight from your original. Suave openia tha eldan bok, as we open the old book. So, or that swa can mean thus or as. Um, so it can mean a couple of different things, but um, mm. definitely is a construction you'll see a lot in Old English mm -hmm. poetry, the swa. Um, beginning uh, a line or a, a half line, the second half of a line. Um, so, and then the, the uh, no no difficulty there really. Uh, I just had to get the right endings uh, because Old English is a, a very highly uh, inflected and declined language. So mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the the case endings and everything have to be correct. So yeah. Thus leovu elafagum talathara fealindra recha. So this is an interesting line for me. Um, I had a hard time exactly figuring out oil stained. That was a, a bit of a tricky <laughs> part. Um, the word fagum, so ela is, is oil and fagum there means one meaning is stained, another is decorated. Um, so it's a- Oh, I like, I, I like decorated just as much. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad. Nice. Yeah, yeah, good. And, and of course, leavu means pages, but of course leaves um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, that's where that word, uh, our modern word, leave, uh, in, in the sense of a page, comes from. Tala thara fialin recha. So this is where it got really interesting for me. So uh, in the original, you have uh, recount the tales of the fallen. So uh, rechath was the first word I reached for there because it perfectly uh, conveys the idea of recount, to tell, to narrate. Uh, but uh, tala is is from the old English word talu, which means tale, and the connotations of that are slightly different, perhaps. Um, and that was one I had to ponder on, but I ultimately did settle on uh, talu as as the right word here, uh, because it can it can mean sort of an our our word tale, as in um, it, not necessarily the truth. It could be various tales. Mm. Is mm. that sort of thing. So I thought, you know, in a Malazan context, I kind of like that. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I thought it was fitting and I went with that word. And Fialnra is the one actually, funny enough, I struggled with. So I initially had a different word there. And, and the it, it, it's to mean fallen, yes? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so it comes from the infinitive of the verb is Fialan uh, with an A-N. And Fialnra or fealen is the um, is the uh, uh, past participle. So mm -hmm. uh, fealen mm -hmm. is the past participle. It's one of the strong verbs, uh, which means it's a weird verb. Uh, we would call it irregular these days. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it is there are seven classes of strong verb, and this is one of the, of the seventh class, which is the weirdest of the weird. Uh, so, <laughs> but. So part of my problem was I wasn't initially sure, can I use a past participle here uh, as a noun? Because that's what it is, um, mm -hmm. past participle used as a noun. And also, by the way, that RA ending conveys the genitive plural. Yes. So it's the book of the fallen. Uh, and the thara is the, is the article. And that tells you because it's a highly declined language that it's mm -hmm. genitive plural. 
and Fial and Ra is is uh, tells you that it's plural. I had to go with singular or plural there. So no, no, I, I picked up the the Ra as, as plural. Yeah. 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 So, so anyway, I had initially a different word. I had, um, I had thus whilst. Uh, so the book of the slaughtered is really more <laughs> what that would have meant or the book yeah. of the slain. Um, and I thought about it and I thought, you know, I'm missing so much of the connotation from the original mm. by having it be, now, it's a nice word. While is related to the old Norse val as in Valkyrie, mm -hmm. um, choosers mm -hmm. of the slain. It's an exact mm -hmm. cognate, but uh, but it didn't really convey the full, I think, resonance of Fallen. Uh, so, and I was pleased to discover, I, I, I looked up, can I use the word Fallen? Are, are, is there precedence? Did I, mm -hmm. I could not find anywhere where the word Fallen was used, the past participle was used as a noun, but I know that it's acceptable to do that in Old English because I-, I uh, Just technical question. Um, yeah. And I, 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 I'm asking this because I don't know, but to what extent is um, the recorded uh, Old English, um, written Old English, of course, all of this is coming out of monasteries, is not, right? Mostly. So to what extent um, is there a evidence of the Judeo-Christian um, ethos slipping into the language itself and altering some of the words because a word like fallen uh in in a, in a christian context oh yeah is is pretty poignant um and you would think it would be used you know if if the language had uh adapted and adopted um the christian ethos then yeah. it, it strikes me that it's a word that you would find but at the yeah. same time i guess these monks are primarily recording verbatim um you know from older texts or whatever uh and so they they may well be preserving uh the pagan origins of of the language i'm just yeah. I'm curious about it yeah it's, it's actually a really uh perceptive question and the that word actually interestingly that fagum word back to that mm -hmm. word um fagum, that's a word you will see sometimes um connected to the word for sin. So sin, mm. and so stained with sins um, that you would see more often than uh, to my knowledge. And I could be wrong about this, but I can't recall seeing fallen in the sense that we would use it in a biblical yeah. sense today. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, but you, there are lots of words for, for fallenness, the concept of it, like stained yeah. with sin and, and all of that. Um, yeah. you know, there's plenty of that because of course, literacy has entered the equation with Christianity. So none of this would be written down without Christianity. Uh, yeah. None of the old English uh, corpus at all. Um, so yeah, to some degree or other, it, it, it certainly has crept into just about everything, in, including the secular stuff like Beowulf. Yeah, well, I, I remember sitting in, um, uh, I was at ICFA, uh, International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts, and a grad student was presenting a paper on Beowulf. And in the audience, of course, were, you know, your uh, stalwart um, veterans of, of that particular subject matter, yep. uh, older professors and all the rest. And this young grad student's um, mm -hmm. thesis was that Beowulf is actually an encoded text. Interesting. And by that, I mean, it, um, while it is framed and originates from uh, a Christian ethos, um, there is strong uh, pagan encoding that's present uh -huh. in the script. Uh -huh. And it was a really interesting little thesis. And I, I can't give you the details on, you know, the examples you use, but he got eviscerated by those, by those Beowulf experts. <laughs> we just took him apart. Well, I have to tell you, that. I mean, just... Uh... In brief, my reading of Beowulf is that it is not an epic. It's a lament for the past. Yeah. It's a lament for the ancestors of the poet, um, so yeah. who clearly admired many aspects of, of their, uh, their ethos, their ideals, uh, yeah. their courage, their loyalty, all of that stuff. Uh, now, the, the poet probably was a Christian, uh, and looking back on uh, the, the pagan ancestors, um, probably felt some 
sorrow at the, yeah. the idea that a lot of their ideals led to a kind of futility, if you will, from the oh, perspective. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, I think I've read maybe four translations of Beowulf. Uh huh. Um, maybe Seamus Haney is the one that sort of sticks sticks in my head the most, but uh, John uh, John Gardner as well. Um, oh yeah. The yeah, I find it to be very uh, nostalgic and and lamenting uh, a, a fallen a fallen almost a fallen present uh, to to a, a much greater past. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would, I would definitely yeah, agree with that. So yeah, yeah, no, the Haney, Haney translation is the one I always teach and I mm -hmm. think it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, yeah. So anyway, back to uh, the <laughs> translation. Um, so that word, I'm so glad that I decided on <laughs> Fialindra there uh, because yeah. it does con uh, do a much better job uh, with the, the connotative resonance of the original. Um, so, and then Kynrich Werina, word for Leasa. So uh, this is the frayed empire I translated as uh, the, the idea here is Kynericha could be kingdom, but it also could be region mm -hmm. um, and that sort of thing. So the Anglo-Saxons would not have had a word, I think, for empire necessarily exactly, but I think that conveys it pretty well. And weirina uh, conveys a sense of weariness, uh, falling apart, uh, of, of uh, tiredness on its uh, last legs. <laughs> So it's a word you see in the wanderer, actually, mm -hmm. when, in, in, in association with the exile, who is the mm -hmm. narrator. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the words, and uh, you had in the original, words without warmth. And I wasn't sure if that would have made sense if I just directly translated it. But there's a wonderful um, thing here, uh, again, from the wanderer, I think, but you, you find it in all of those poetry. Frover is comfort. So frover leasa is comfortless. So, mm. yeah, so comfortless words, and the, that is plural, by the way, word, the plural mm -hmm. of word is word <laughs> in Old English, so, yeah, um, so, and uh, yeah, so the next line, line, uh, and by the way, you'll notice that this is, uh, my translation is 11 lines, not 10, like the original, and that is because I wanted to get the, the rhythm of an Old mm -hmm. English poem, uh, to have that, uh, that sense of four, uh, stresses in each line. The initial line might be a bit hypermetric, but I think it, uh, the way I read it shows that there are indeed four stresses in each line. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so that's why it's 11 lines, because I'm getting it to feel a little more like Old English poetry that way. So, so this is a lovely part in your original, and um, I'm pretty happy with the way it came out in the Old English. The herth one of the is glittering on herpsperkan on yeminde on wunyath so you had written the hearth has ebbed and the word ebb is a lovely uh old english word as well mm -hmm. ebbian in old english it derives directly from that however i couldn't find a single instance where it was not associated with water so Ooh, right, I, right. I couldn't find a metaphorical instance of the word eb, ebbian. And I could be wrong about this. That it might have been used that way. It might be, have been recognized by people that way. But I ultimately opted to go with wanoda, which is our word wane. So uh, to wane. Um, so the hearth wanes is the more literal translation of what I've done here. I think it conveys uh, pretty well what you meant there. Uh, I hope, <laughs> um, but his, yeah, his um, gleam, glitterung is gleam and herpsperkan, instead of, I initially had leafsperka, uh, but Dr. Anderson actually gave me some, a really nice idea here to make it herpsperkan. So leafsperkan would have been literal life sparks, mm -hmm. um, but herp has a much more, has much more resonance as a word in Old English than leaf does. Herp could mean so many other things. Uh, it could mean spirit. It could mean, uh, in addition to heart, you can see that it, it's, it's heart, yeah. heart. Yeah. Know, so. But spirit, it could mean um, uh, uh, one's uh, mood. Uh, it, it, has, it just has a ton of poetic resonance. Um, and I think uh, that, it, that's so similar to um, Homer's the Iliad, where uh -huh. you know, the organs are all, you know, they're, they're the repositories um, of. A whole series of emotions, um, although maybe more in the Odyssey than, than the Iliad. Now that I think about it, but 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've read uh, Julian Jaynes, but I think it may have been mentioned in, in somebody's comments. I have on, heard the um, name now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it'd be interesting to, I mean, if you do read, um, uh, oh, what's the title of the book? It's a fabulous, it's one of my favorite titles of all, of any book. Uh, where is it? I have it somewhere here. Okay. Yeah, but you're right. One of my viewers did mention it in the comments. Yeah. 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 My there, oh, there it is. The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Oh, cool. Yeah. Isn't that a great title? A great title. I love, I love it. that title. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that sounds like one I definitely want to read for sure. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because uh, if you don't mind, we just go off in Jane's for a little bit. Um, sure, why not? Uh, he's one of those characters who had, well, a kind of a polymath kind of uh, background. So he knew his he knew his literature, he knew archaeology, um, and he also knew um, abnormal psychology so wow. and, and brain function and all the rest so yeah one of these one of these characters who could sort of speak with authority on a multiple a multitude of, of subject matter a rare breed and, and generally what happens is when somebody like I produces a theory a grand theory is that specialists from within those various areas jump all over him and take him apart oh, right so yeah yeah of course um and when they do so they they become very pedantic and and they <laughs> they specifically concentrate on those elements that uh to their mind um negates the entire argument right they pick on one or two things so um neuro uh, anatomy uh specialists and and this kind of thing you know or point out you know well what James is saying that actually physically can't happen. And that was never in, you know, it was never in the structure of the brain or the skull and all the rest. Therefore, you know, throw, throw up the bathwater with everything else. Um, and that really annoyed me because it struck me that th they were missing the point. And the point of what, what Julian James was saying, I'll give you just the premise of, uh, or a rundown of, of his argument is that Sometime in the period between the Iliad and the Odyssey, so Bronze Age, uh, and the Bronze Age collapse, um, there was a shift in consciousness. Um, and when he first describes it, he describes it as being a uh, structural shift uh, in, in the opening up of, of the two halves of the brain suddenly being able to connect with each other. Wow. And that prior to that, they were separate and so when when people heard the voice of god uh -huh. or a god or a spirit or an ancestor it was i don't know if you've ever had the experience of hearing somebody shout in your ear but nobody's there huh. it's like this, this voice that just pops in um i think i've had it maybe twice in my life but and and this is what he's saying is that there was this huge shift and so if you analyze the iliad and compare it to the Odyssey, yeah. you can actually textually, uh, oh. you can determine the shift because the Iliad has no introspection uh -huh. and it has no inner landscape um, for these characters. And they'll do weird things like, you know, um, what's it, Agamemnon falls into a rage uh, against Achilles and, um, or it might be the other way around, but anyways, I can't remember the details, but one character goes up to another saying, you know, you slept with my wife and, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, all hell is going to break loose. Huh. And the other person says, the God told me to. And then the first person says, oh, and walks away. Wow. So that is, that is a mindset in terms of motivation and, and character that is as alien to us as, as you could imagine. Um, whereas when you get to the Odyssey, you've got all the internal landscape of, of Odysseus and um and his motivations and his reasons for doing things and, and all of these things so it is there's a fundamental shift between the two and then you go to the archaeology and during the bronze age collapse you've got you know um clay tablets from priests that were caught in fires and you know, things were burning down everywhere yeah and all the all of them are saying the same thing they're saying gods why have you stopped listening 
why can I not hear you anymore? Oh, wow. And it, it, so all of these things kind of fit together. And what he's arguing is at a certain level of social complexity, uh, so a certain level of population and um, uh, sheer numbers uh, and, and uh, the more complicated societies become uh, as the rise of the state, um, the more pressure there is um, on the brain. And wow. what actually triggers, what is triggered is, is that complexity and, and written language then is part of it. And, and it all, everything changes at that point. Wow. But anyways, it, it's, it's an extraordinary theory. So, you know, when the neuro uh, anatomists go after Jane's for getting things wrong in, in the structure of the brain, right? They're not they're not taking into account the archaeology or the literary analysis because they they know fuck all about those things, right? Exactly. So they just toss those away. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and so it's to me it it's it's a thesis that that fulminates in in my head all the time because. I, I struggled with the Iliad in every read because something ah. did not, as a writer, something did not make sense. And I could not pin down what was, what was all very, very strange and alien about it. Yeah. yeah and yeah, then yeah. this book arrives, uh, uh, or I discover it and I go, he's explained exactly why this is the case. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. So yeah, I recommend it. It's a great read. Very Whether cool. you agree or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, well, the next time my wife scolds me for eating too many cookies, I'm just going to say the God told me to. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. I don't know if that'll get me off the hook, but uh, so anyway, that that is cool. I will check that out. That is definitely the kind of thing. I love reading that kind of thing, that thinkers who are uh, going outside of their own disciplinary boundaries and using yeah. other fields to, to shed light on um, you know certain very important facets of our existence. So yeah, absolutely great. Yeah, I'm just hold on a sec. There's another book I was going to point out. Um, okay. One I read recently along that line while you're looking is uh, Robert Sapolsky's Behave. That's a book. Which one? Behave. It's called by Robert oh, Sapolsky. Okay. Um, and he's looking into the question of free will, uh, but he he is, I think, a neuroscientist. Uh, yeah. He, he uses stuff from all over the place. Uh, well, that and that's the stuff I appreciate because that's kind of my interest. I'm sort of all over the place as well. Yep. There's another one I don't know if you've heard of too, uh, and it's uh, by Douglas Hofstadter, and it's called Goodell Escher Bach. And this was written in the 1970s. Uh, this was one that was explaining consciousness. And it's a, it's a, it's a very highly revered book among computer programmers, I guess. Uh, but Interesting. Yeah, I know he was, he, I mean, a lot of AI stuff. And, 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 but Goodall was a mathematician, uh, Escher, the, the artist, yeah. Yeah. and Bach. And it had a lot to do with loops, and uh, he explained consciousness through what he called strange loops. Uh, it's a really fascinating book, but yeah. yeah. What's the other one you've got there? Um, it's called The Immortality Key. Oh, yeah. The Secret History of the Religion with No Name. And it's about the early um, creation of beer and wine, and the fact that beer and wine in its early forms uh, relating to uh, the mysteries, um, so early Greek stuff, and to the east of there, um, was actually far different from our, our beer and wine, and that it mostly filled with psychotropic um, drugs, basically. Wow. And yeah, and he's done his research. It's um, he's done a, a whole lot of research, actually. Cool. So, yeah. I imagine the, the cult of Dionysus is figures yes. large in there. Yeah. Yeah, and the the Elysian the 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 mysteries and all the rest. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so it's fascinating reading because yeah, he's doing the detective work and, and traveling all over all over the, the old world and um, following wow. this this line of argument and this line of thought. Wow, very cool. Including including chemical analyses of the inside of you know old pottery pot shirts as they would. Oh yeah. Say. Yeah. <laughs> yes, You're, you've been picked on for the, the use of that word, I think, uh, every now and again. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
that and uh, ochre, I guess. But yeah, but AP did a great video on ochre, so um, he should do well, a concert yeah. video. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, there, there's there's more than one meaning to the to ochre, so um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, well, back to words here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Old English words. That's a nice bonus, though, for the viewers, I think. Uh, so uh, where were we now? Saher uh, Thwanoda, we did that. The gleams and oh, yes. So the oh, uh, uh, hold on. Can we go back to the the, the heart? Because yes, you've 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 blended at least two things in there. Right. It's not just that word is not just heart. Correct. Yeah. Right. It's like heart. Uh, so hearth is is hearth like you have yeah. in the original. Yeah, um, but it has many connotations as yeah. well. It can mean the home as well. It, you can, it, it is by extension the entire home. Uh, so uh, it is a, a word that has a lot of uh, resonance as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, you had it in the beginning and the at the end of the third line, the hearth. Yeah, yeah, and, and I I view I view the word hearth as uh, more connotative than denotative, anyways. Uh -huh. um, yeah. yeah, because, you know, the anthropological take is the hearth is the center of everything um, yeah. within a group. Yeah, so. yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and so I think the word hert sperkan then was a good choice, yeah. uh, uh, sort of looking back to the word hearth uh, as well. I think that's what you were saying. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so the uh, the heart sparks and, and the gleam. Mm. Um, Dwell on on Yamunda on Wuniath means dwell in memory is what that means literally. Nice, yeah. very nice. So on Wuniath is to dwell. Yeah, and Yagam Wakiendam Bihindan means simply behind weakening eyes. So mm. to convey what you had written there against dimming mm. eyes, and I wasn't really sure how to get the word dimming exactly, but I'm pretty happy with with the word weakening. Yeah, in there. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it conveys the right thing there. So, uh, and then we have who farath min mod, what zindan binu yehildas. And this simply means how fares my, now mod, our modern word mood comes from mod, but it means so much more in Old English. It means spirit, it means heart, it means courage, it means all these things. So it's a rich word in Old English. And I, I really like it there. So how fares my, my mod, my, my spirit, uh, and farith, by the way, is where our word fair uh, comes from, but it also conveys the, like the sense of wandering and that sort of thing. So I thought, it... can, can you read those, those two those two phrases again? Sure. Who farith min mod, what zindan mino yehudas? Yehudas, my goodness. Um, yeah. You know, my parents are Swedish, right? And, oh, yes, right. You know, yeah. uh, I only lived for one year in Sweden when I was five. Huh. um before they moved back huh. um but hugh does is about as swedish sounding a word as, as i think i've ever heard yeah um, and even the the uh the rhythm of how you read it sounded yeah. very swedish which is you know old norse uh, derived but yeah yeah i yep. could see the i could see the connections that's interesting yeah it wasn't hard for me to learn old norse after knowing old english no, i would think are, not are, fairly close in many yeah. respects. Um, so yeah, that, and it, it's funny you say that because a lot of times when I read Old English, people say, wow, that sounds like Swedish or, <laughs> or so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. Um, so, but uh, yeah, the Yehudas means thoughts, um, essentially. So what are my thoughts? What zindan minu Yehudas? What are my thoughts? Yeah. 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 Um, Swa ich openia tha bok thara fialen ra. So as I open the book of the fallen is simply what that means. Yeah, um, but I noticed that your first use of the word fallen was not capitalized and the second one is. Yeah, and I know you capitalized it in the beginning. Um, yeah. So I, I wrestled with that, whether yeah. you capitalize uh, both um, or not, and ultimately decided um, it would have for, for whatever reason, I felt that it made more sense in the Old English to have the it not capitalized. But, I, yeah. it's, you know, but when it's associated with the book, the book of mm -hmm. the fallen, I think. Uh, and it, it, I'm trying to think if it would have been even capitalized in Old English, but uh, I'm not entirely certain. <laughs> mm. But it might have been. It, it probably would have been uh, to emphasize its importance. That it, 
So, but anyway, yeah, uh, that's fairly straightforward in terms of meaning. I love the next bit here. On edia thonostench yerdaga. And then I have a whole half line just with hot and then a kind of a pause, which would be unconventional in Old English. But what I'm going for here in my translation is kind of a late West Saxon standard. And that was a time when there was more experimentation. Literacy had been in uh, around for hundreds of years at that point. And so you see a lot more experimentation. And so I like to think that maybe this could be seen as sort of a, a, a bit of an experimental sort of uh, move here to have what you would normally see it at the beginning of a line, not at the end, uh, and often at the beginning. Well, of the line. Yeah, yeah, I know. But that's what I love about this is that listening to this, I can imagine, you know, a half dozen people sitting around a fire in a forest somewhere. Yeah. And this is what's prefacing everything. And then as he's lulled, or she has lulled everyone in. That's when they hit with that, that what to, yep. you know, leaning forward into the firelight and just wham, wake up people, right? Here we go. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's really cool. Yeah. And of course, Beowulf begins with hot. Yeah. Yeah. It goes hot. You know, so it's like, you know, the closest thing. I think if you want to a modern people to understand how old English poetry and, and probably the ancient Greek stuff as well, the closest thing I think is rap, is freestyle rap particularly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that word hot, it would have been like, yo, you know, at the beginning of a rap, it's like, pay attention here, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so, but uh, that line on edia thonostench yerdaga, so that means literally, and breathe in the scent of the days of yore. Yeah, mm, yeah. that's even better than, than the original line. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could. There's no exact word for history mm. I think, in old English, no. so I had to go with yer daga, uh, which is uh, days of yore, and you see it in that opening line of Beowulf as well. So yeah. that same word, the your yeah. days, yer daga. So and breathe in the. Now here's the word. Uh, our modern word stench comes from that word there, stench. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you can see that in modern English, it's taken on a pejorative sense. But in old mm -hmm. English, it was absolutely neutral. And some things uh, could even be wonderful smelling and be described as a stench. <laughs> so, on ediathon a stench yer daga, and breathe in the scent of the your days. So, uh, and then what? Now, this is the point where the bard is going to wake everybody up here and, and say, listen, you know. Um, so, say edgung fer thus word. And that simply means, um, that uh, <clears throat> that uh, breath carries those words, okay? So uh, that breath carries these words, evgung meaning breath. Very rare word in Old English, by the way, but uh, hmm. definitely legitimate there. Uh, that breath, care, no, fereth is for our word, fairy comes from that word in, in, from Old English. So to carry, to convey, mm -hmm. but it's also a pretty rich word in terms of connotations, so. Hlosnyathel means listen to them, listen to the words, listen to the words. Hlosnyath. Das tala zinden ura yal ratala und eft ura tala. So I tried to convey that sense of um, cyclical cyclicality that you have in the beginning here. Uh, at the, uh, sorry, at the end of the poem, where you have these tales are the tales of us all again, yet again. And so I tried to convey that cyclicality here on eft uratala. And there's a bit of repetition, mm -hmm. which is would be unconventional in Old English poetry, but I really like the effect here. Uh, mm -hmm. And so those, those tales are the tales of us all, it means literally. And again, of, of, um, the tales of us all, essentially. Again, all of our tales, essentially, is what mm -hmm. it means. So, and then finally, the yerdagas on oslivia. Which means the your days live in us, the endless your days. So that, that's how I translated your last line. You know? Yeah, well, the audience of Beowulf would have loved that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. I think so, particularly because of the theme we talked about of yeah. the, the poet looking back on the past. Yeah. Yeah. And what and, and you know, what does a book do? It 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 traps the past, you know, whatever the tale you're telling, it's it's 
it freezes it in place and so yep. it allows it allows the audience the reader the listener to reoccupy that past yeah very much so very much so yeah so that's it that's the translation that i came that's up so with. cool thank you yeah i really enjoyed it a lot um so well now now you have to do the rest of the series <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> well, you know what i will do the the end poem i will do that all right okay yeah we'll have to settle for that uh i'm not sure i could do it. how many millions of words would that be uh, three three plus yeah <laughs> oh dear and then you'll have me doing carcanus as well i guess yeah well <clears throat> i once looked into uh somebody had set up a program but they were charging i can't remember what they were charging for it but out of New York that takes um, uh, prose text and converts it into uh, iambic, iambic pentameter. Oh. And yeah, and I wanted to plug all of the Malaysian Book of the Fallen into that to see what would come out. Wow. But I never ended up not buying the program, but. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of those trends, we're still at a stage, I think, where a lot of those translation type programs are rubbish um yeah essentially um but they're getting better i guess but yeah so but anyway so now i think we are ready so i'm going to warn our viewers um because we are going to talk about the original poem and some of the, the i mean it's just a such a, a rich poem and there's so much to say about it uh, but we're going to say a few things about it but i do want to warn the viewers we might be saying things that would be spoilers and we will be saying things that are spoilers for the entire series, for the entirety of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, all 10 books. So if you don't want to hear those spoilers, this is your warning. And for anyone else who wants to hang around and hear what we have to say about this prefatory poem, um, here we go. So, uh, and as I said before, it doesn't actually have a title. I'm just working title calling it Book of the Fallen. Um, but uh, this is, I think it's fair to say, as we said in the beginning, tonally very important for mm. the series, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Tonally, it sets the it sets the tone, and it's the epigraph for the entire series. So, mm -hmm. as an author, you're telling us important things here, aren't you? Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them aren't going to make sense until we finish the entire series. Yeah. Uh, and then you go back and you realize, oh, that Erickson, that's what he was doing there. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, that happens to me a lot, actually. Um, but uh, but here, I think it's just such a wonderful beginning to the series, and we're at a point now where the uh, somebody is looking at this book. This is a book that is so it's it's kind of a a little bit of a meta thing, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. You have a, a now we're going full spoilers here, so yeah, um, this is, is a meta thing in the sense that we have a, a, a narrator here. Who is telling us I'm, I'm opening this old book here and i'm going to be telling you this story um this is a, this is the story of old times i'm looking back on them now yeah and uh so that if i could go ahead and just skip right to recount the tales of the fallen the word fallen the reason why i really found it important to somehow duplicate the resonance of that the mm -hmm. connotative resonance of the original so the word fallen obviously can refer directly to soldiers who have died in battle, right? There is, of course, that meaning. Fallen, and you mentioned the, the, the sort of Judeo-Christian understanding of the word fallen as something that has fallen away or decayed or, or that sort of thing. So in the sense of something being broken. Um, and I think that's also applicable in some ways to the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Brokenness is a big theme in here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But then, of course, there is a particular individual who is especially broken, and that individual is referred to as the fallen god in many places, and that is, of course, the crippled god, right? Yeah. And this is his book. This is the book uh, that uh, we are we are just Kamensad. We are. This is Kamensad giving us a direct message here. Uh, yeah. Essentially, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I thought I have to somehow convey that with in the translation, because that, yeah. that's very important. I thought it would be important to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, the original inspiration was um, uh, came out of uh, a visit to Paris. Um, huh. So Gardens of the Moon had already been written, but there was no Malaz and Book of the Fallen. There was no sort of overarching title to, to the series. Um, and my wife and I were in Paris and visiting uh various museums and 
in one of them, there's mention of uh, Napoleon's list of the dead, list of the fallen oh. uh, from his campaigns. So huh. all the people who participated in the campaigns who died uh, were all part of a master list. And that was so evocative that it just stayed with me. And so, you know, when I came back to uh, back to England and was picking up the old manuscript to revise um, after eight years of sitting gathering dust, um, that huge frame sense fell into place at that point. And um, so, in that sense, the Book of the Fallen. I mean that that. That even the, the title is lifted directly from Napoleon and so from, from our history. But then, of course, once you start thinking about that, you start thinking about it in a more poetic sense, um, yeah. in more connotative sense, uh, rather than just a list of, of names. Um, right. That there are stories behind all those names. And that's what this is going to be about. Huh. Interesting. So you didn't know that when you wrote this poem necessarily that it would apply to the crippled god or do you didn't um no at this point um at this point i already had the frame okay, um, because, okay. yeah 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 because uh, i had to have it in order to write the latest that version of gardens of the moon in order to revise gardens of the moon i had to have a sense of where this was going to end up uh-huh uh-huh yeah yeah cool very cool wow all right so and uh the sense of in here a uh, frayed empire words without warmth there's a real weariness to this yeah um, there is a sense of and, and of course and throughout the series you you get the sense that the malazan empire is is <laughs> falling apart um essentially yeah. yeah really falling apart i mean it, right from uh uh, well, you, you can see hints of it even in Gardens of the Moon, but it really hits you in Dead House Gates, of mm -hmm. course, um, with the rebellion and everything and the chain of dogs and mm -hmm. all that. So um, words without warmth. And that's a curious, I'm, I'm curious about that particular segment. And there's some lovely alliteration in your original as well, by the way. Um, but um, so we're, we're looking back on this uh, in the sense of the hearth as well. The hearth ebbing there's a sense of of something that's about to die here isn't there mm -hmm. and we're looking back it reminds me of a, a poem by tennyson tears idle tears uh, mm. looking back on uh the speaker looking back on his life and and remembering all of the the friends and everything that had been lost and that that yeah. just poignant sense there of of uh, sorrow um that that's that's definitely in this poem uh for sure mm. And I guess it applies to all the individuals that we we met in the series, all these people we become so attached to, as well as the larger entity of, of the empire and everything else that has fallen away. Yeah, um, but also the fact that a good many of these characters, um, Cam and I had gamed, and you know we had we were past our years of gaming because we were no longer living in, in the same continent, for that matter. Wow. So I suppose there was a slight nostalgia or melancholy related to our, you know, those times in our youth that that wow. uh, were the formula formulative periods um, for the entire Malazan world. Wow. And so by that, you know, by the time I'm writing this thing, Cam has also shelved uh, Return of the Crimson Guard and is teaching English in Japan or somewhere like that. Huh. Um, but also in a PhD program, uh, I think he was, um, his PhD subject matter was, um, travel writers of the 19th century or something like and that. 18th century. Maybe 18th century. Yeah. But yeah. 18th century. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was like, um, all of that, that huge body of, of experience and knowledge and memory, um, was at risk of just dwindling away to nothing, um, finding no audience ever. And so I think, you know, looking back on it, um, you know, when I revised Gardens, the Gardens of the Moon in, in, in Surrey, in the UK, um, my uh, contemporary fiction book had already just come out with, with uh, Potter and Stoughton. So, you know, I was being pulled in that direction. And um, this was my last shot 
a last shot at, at uh, getting the fantasy stuff uh, on board. Wow. And so I suspect that that is underlying this particular poem um, because, you know, uh, Cam was no longer sending off his manuscripts. Um, I had tried, I'd failed uh, the first time around. Here I was revising it um, every night after work uh, in this pub. And, you know, I didn't know if my agent was going to accept it. I didn't know if the agent was going to then try to market it. Um, and then I didn't know if it was just going to bounce back the same way it did the first time around. So, wow. yeah, a lot of that is sitting, I think, underneath all this. Um, the last chance to open this book. And, um, and so then, you know, the book gets, finds its editor, finds its publisher and gets yeah. picked up. And that just let, you know, that let the, the, let the horses free and everything just ran wild from that point. And that's probably why I wrote, you know, 10 books in 11 years because yeah, that's amazing. The floodgates were opened at that point and it had been held back for so long huh. um, that there was a sense that it was all, you know, all going to fade away. It, it was, it would never be seen, never be witnessed by anyone. Um, so I needed to get it out. And then once, once I signed, uh, the book deal for the full series i got cam on board and he started you know returning to his first love which was writing and yeah uh, thank goodness and we, yeah. you know the rest is history as they say but uh, i think at this point there's a lot there's a lot lying underneath this that's more personal huh. uh, not necessarily related to uh, the series itself but in a metatextual sense it is right mm -hmm. because everything we created was this conscious effort on our part um, when we gained to create this history and um, now was going to be a chance one last chance anyways to tell that history wow so, fingers huh. crossed and I, I guess it worked so i think it worked out pretty well yeah i think so yeah. <laughs> in retrospect but that is just something so I mean, the, the idea that this could be both Cam and Saad and also you and on a, oh, and on yeah. a very personal level, that Absolutely. I, the, the I opening the Book of the Fallen isn't yeah. just Cam and Saad, it's, it's you. Wow. It's, it's both of us. Um, yeah. And Cam and Saad as, as uh, the crippled God, I mean, metaphorically, every writer who writes a novel is the God of that novel, right? They are yeah. the creator. Yep. Um, and crippled in the sense of um, pretty battle weary by that point, uh, you know, huh. working jobs I never wanted to work, um, uh, writing corporate uh, uh, film scripts, um, like for corporate, um, corporate whatever. And so really feeling like I was just wasting my talent or, or whatever talent I had. Yeah, uh, using it for things that I objected to on every level, you know, in terms of advertising and corporations. Sure. Um, so yeah, they're you know, so crippled in that sense. Um, huh. Unlike a lot of you know fantasy writers now who are getting published in the early '30s, you know, I was I was well past that. So it really was the last the last shot. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Well, I'm, I'm so glad it worked out the way it did, mm. for sure. Well, me too. It happened the way it happened, and, and I'm glad. Um, but but that's that's amazing. I mean, that just really opens it up even more for me, the idea. Of, um, and so I'm, I'm just looking at the poem again after hearing what you had to say and thinking, oh, my goodness. Um, so you, when you with that line, uh, and breathe deep the scent of history, we're talking about, of course, the history of the Malazan world, but you're talking about your your own history. Of oh, it's per, yeah, it's personal history. Very yeah. personal with you yeah. and Cam developing this world together and yeah. all of that. That's just beautiful. And, wow. you know, the Book of the Fallen in, in the mid the mid uh, line six, um, when it's when it's sort of laid out there. Yeah. I mean, that's as much the game notes as anything else. Right. <laughs> you know? It's yeah. just there, right? Open up these these ratty pages because I, I never I never stored things very well, so it was all a mess. And is that where the oil stain comes from? Oh, guaranteed. I could have written coffee stained, you know, <laughs> any of these things. Um, yeah, and, and that's the thing when 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 you're trying to sort of evoke something, you want to you want to pull the familiar, um, so that you carry that familiar into the unfamiliar, and so um, it 
uh, you know, I overuse the word verisimilitude, but that's part of what, you know, this is all about. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you've been, oh, hanging, yeah, around, you've been yeah. hanging around AP, so you're allowed to use the word verisimilitude. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so oh wow that's just beautiful uh the scent of history now is just so uh kind of mind-blowing really well uh, and think about it i mean these really were moldy dusty pages that were following yeah. me in cardboard boxes um all over the yeah. place and um i know ap has gone through some of those archives and actually put them in proper plastic boxes and stuff um but even wow. he was despairing at the condition of all this stuff and so uh, yeah, I'm sure, you know, I had a pile of character sheets and, and notes and stuff from games and the maps, and it would have, it would have smelled that, you know, that, that smell you get out of old paper. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, as we all know, scent is highly nostalgic. Isn't well. it? Yeah. It's associated with memory very closely more than the other senses. So yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so wonderful. Huh. And we breathe deep the scent of history. So, ah, listen then to these words carried on that breath. So that's the, the words carried in, uh, in, in that are evoked in your memory, I suppose, upon just smelling the scent of that old book, you know? Huh. Yeah. Oh, that's great stuff. That's, I think all book lovers can relate to that for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 But these tales are the tales of us all then. Let's, let's talk about those last couple lines. These tales are the tales of us all again, yet again. We are history relived and that is all. Without end, that is all. So within the, the Malazan context, um, as I said before, I think there's a, a, a nice um, nod to the cyclicality of things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a major theme in the series. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that uh, this has happened before, uh, that uh, we, we have these layers of, of civilizations uh, that have come before so beautifully illustrated in, in just about every single one, and probably in every single one of the, of the books. Mm. Um, and of course, you both were archaeologists, and so it's just so fitting um, that you would portray that so lovingly and so well, it, it's, it's it's also the soul crushing lesson of archaeology. Yes, it really is. You know, yeah, it's, true. Um, you know, I, I've, I've tried to convey this to people. Um, when I talk about teepee rings uh, in, in on the Great Plains um, yeah. in Alberta or Saskatchewan or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times people just go, yeah, OK, the circles of stones. Um, uh, and they were the stones that held down the edges of the teepees. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, that's your sort of technical description, technical definition of a teepee ring. But I, when I find a teepee ring, uh, my heart breaks because it is the last time someone, it, that's the evidence what you're looking at. It's the last time someone camped there living wow. that particular lifestyle, that culture, that wow. way of living, which, it, you know, they, they had, had been part of them for generation upon generation. Yep. And each teepee ring marks the last moment of that. Hmm. And to me, it's just, it's, it's crushing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and Cam and I, even in our gaming, when we were, you know, providing settings for each other um, and, and doing the expositional verbal oral descriptions of, you know, where your characters are, what they've come into. Yeah. We would be evoking that all the time. Um, that was just, you know, always there all that sense of um, the remnants of things that have passed. It's yeah. not just that things have passed, it's that they've been reduced to um, almost so few details that most of, of knowledge and most of the awareness and most of the specificity uh, of that past is lost to us. And as archeologists, that's what we're looking at. It's just these small, tiny remnants um and the rest is can only be found in contemplating human nature and the human condition and and the things that we share across time including deep time um yeah. and that's yeah that was always there uh, in the gaming stuff and so you know in, in creating the world it had to be there as well oh yeah and it is there uh, it's with the tice and d it's with mm. the uh, various human civilization like the wiccans uh those who are uh, uh what is red masks uh 
people the all the all yeah. of course yeah it's with the all i mean all these these civilizations uh these peoples who are in danger of disappearing um yeah. there's a real poignancy to that and it's also by the way a very very it's maybe the central theme of old english poetry so this is a very fitting exercise in that sense because you constantly hear about how life is fleeting in old English poetry. There's a wonderful poem, for example, uh, in addition to the, the exile poems like The Wanderer, mm -hmm. there's one called The Ruin, which is a, a poem simply about a, a ruin, but it is a contemplative poem. It's just looking at this, this, this remnant of the past, but you just feel the weight of it, the sorrow of the, what were the lives that were lived in this place, you know, how many hundreds of years ago, that sort of thing. And it's just so powerful. So and, and it's weird because as an archaeologist, you, you're you're pulled in the direction of uh, objective, rational analysis of artifacts and sites and, and all the rest. Yeah. But I never dwelt there. Um, you know, I was very much a field archaeologist. I, I needed to get out there. I needed to read the landscape. I needed to immerse myself in the landscape huh. and then peel it back in time if I could. Uh, and then look for those few, you know, instances where human presence has has scratched its it, itself you know in, into the ground or, or or whatever yeah um so there was always a, a very heady emotional context for for me as an archaeologist um which you know persists to this day um i can't i can't walk on sites and and, and just think in objective terms at all huh. um i'm always looking for the other stuff and it's the other stuff you cannot find, right? You know, it's just not there. So the imagination is the only place where you can uh, resurrect um, any sense of that. Wow. Well, that approach to your archaeology is certainly inseparable, I would say, from mm -hmm. your fiction. And I am so glad it is so, um, <laughs> because it, it certainly resonates with me. Um, it's one of the reasons I love the series so much. Um, but yeah. Beautiful. Any other any other things you would like to say about uh, this prefatory poem? Um, I think the, the last two lines are actually a warning. OK. Um, and maybe an announcement that, you know, what follows is going to plunge into the human condition um, as far as I was, you know, I am uh, actually capable of doing. And it was it was going to go all the way um wow and and yeah there there is that element of uh shared trauma um shared experience uh and the fact that you know e even within a single lifetime um there are things that through the process of growing uh we all end up sharing at some mm -hmm. point or another the loss of, of a parent for example yes. you know it, it's universal um and so in that sense what you're going to get in this in the story is 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 nothing new it's just reworked it's relived um yeah. over and over again and uh the only thing that would be unique will be the settings and you know but it's all human condition related so settings to me are, are less relevant than than what the characters are experiencing and feeling right yeah, that's beautiful. That also reminds me of how another prominent theme in here is that sense of connection that yeah. uh, happens on a very personal level many times in the series as, as various characters are thrown together in these situations, but a sort of universal connection as well. And that is something that I think is central as well to the, the books, this mm -hmm. idea that we aren't just these individuals we're not even our our neighborhood. We're not our our, our contemporary culture. No. We are so much more than that. There is yeah. a vastness to uh, existence that we don't normally think about because we're so wrapped up in this little ego here. And it's just so powerful when your eyes are opened by something like this, and you get a much bigger. It's almost like you're pulled outside yourself. Mm. It's, it's a spiritual experience, I would call it. I would call it a, a, um, an awakening of a, of a sort. And it's something that you get to experience as you read these books. Um, so Well, yeah, I guess creatively as well. Um, 
you know, what I've just described, how I, how I step onto an archaeological site uh, yeah. anywhere. Um, and all uh, that, it's, it's a hard thing to describe. It, it, it's not just wonder, there's melancholy. Um, yep. There's a real sense of, of the passing of time, which then you, you end up, you can't help but personalize at some point, the passing of your own time. And, you know, um, how things were when you were 12 years old versus how they are now. And, yeah. and yeah. so all that sort of lands on, at least it lands on me. Um, and then when I sit down to write a story and I create a setting, and quite often these settings are built off of things I've seen uh, archaeologically, you know, in terms of uh, ruins or whatever, um, mm. landscapes anyways, that I'm familiar with as an archaeologist. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I end up building that scene and I cannot help but build that melancholy into, you know, in, into the tone of what I'm writing because I'm now like the archeologist that I was uh, in real life, walking onto this fictional landscape. And hmm. that's how I'm going to, you know, interact with it. That's how I'm going to feel and, and how I'm going to see it and how I'm going to describe it. Huh. Wow, that's beautiful. Well, it, it does certainly show in the work. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen now. Okay. So everyone can see us bigger again. <laughs> so, well, it's it's been a just a fantastic discussion for me. I feel like I've learned a lot here and uh, about the books. And uh, I just want to thank you for um, for giving me this little project because I really enjoyed it, actually. It was, uh, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I loved hearing it. It sounded, it just, it's similar to hearing, you know, Beowulf and, you know, when it's, when it's performed um, in, its, in its original, original language that you just get this, you get this echo of antiquity that sort of reverberates through it uh, in the harshness of the language, which then evokes the landscape of that language, where it came from, you know, the, the, uh, the Scandinavian setting of, of mm -hmm. for, ferocious weather and, and, yeah. and bleakness and, and all of these things. It, it, to me, uh, Old English just, it is that language, you know, it's, um, yeah, so to hear that was really cool. Yeah, it, it, there is a bleakness to it that puts things in a sort of a starkness, I think. Yeah. There's a, you know, and, and there's almost a kind of um, a duality that can result of, you know, dark and light and that sort of thing. Um, and, and it's uh, the past and the present and all of that yeah. as, as it, they live in a kind of symbiosis with one another. Um, so, yeah, that's a that's a cool thing, too. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. So cool. Well, I'm glad you, you liked it. I'm very glad. And Loved it. Uh, I will be doing at some point, uh, probably after the current semester, I'll be doing the, uh, the, the ending poem as well. So cool. And I look cool. forward to that. So you can have the complete bookends. Uh, <laughs> and they're of a piece, I guess, too, aren't they? They're of a piece in a sense. They are. Yeah. 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 So beautiful. Well, thank you once again. And um, uh, it's been such a pleasure, like I said, discussing this with you today. And I'm really excited to be uh, continuing with the, the read I'm, I'm doing with along with AP, uh, mm -hmm. which has been just so, I, I described it in a recent video as being an experience that is every bit as profound, if not more, than writing my PhD dissertation. And I'm, I mean that in the best possible light. Wow. Uh, because no, it, it's been so profoundly touching to me, um, the series and, and Cam's books as well uh, that I'm reading along with AP too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just, huh, I, I keep thinking to myself, wow, this is, I can, okay, this is, what, this is what fantasy can do. This is what literature can do. This is amazing. Um, so. Uh, it's really something special for me. And, and the fact that AP is also doing it along with me has made it just uh, levels and levels more wonderful than it could have been. Cool. So, yeah. Well, he's full of shit, but apart from that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Professor Fireballs. He's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thanks again, Steve. Yeah. And I hope to talk to you again, maybe when we're done with our, our read for the series. Cool. That would be good. All right. Bye-bye then. Bye-bye.